I'm Dr. Chris Nowinski. Most insights come out of mutually shared experiences. So tell me if this is familiar to your life. You graduate from Harvard in 2000 where you played football and you decide you want to sign up for a reality television show on MTV called Tough Enough, where 13 people live in a house together and compete for a contract to become a professional wrestler with WWE. And while you're on the show, you have a match with the trainers, and one of the trainers decides to go old school with you and take it from a professional wrestling match into a full-on assault. Who is this familiar for? Anyone? Is it just me? Am I the only one? Okay, well then to make it a mutually shared experience, let me show you what happened. So what you don't see happens next is I roll out of the ring and I'm wandering around in circles. And I've got this thought on a loop in my head that I can't get out that's, when did I go to the beach? I don't remember going to the beach, but I have sand in my mouth. And I'm chewing on sand, and I don't remember going to the beach. And then 20 minutes of that, and boom, it hits me. I'm not chewing on sand. I'm chewing on my teeth. He chipped my teeth when he punched me in the face. And he gave me what I now know was a concussion or a brain injury. But I didn't know that that was important. And I didn't know that that was serious. And I didn't tell anybody. And it didn't hurt me then. And I ended up making it to the big time. And I was on WWE's Monday Night Raw. And I played a guy everyone loved to hate. They called Chris Harvard. And all was going very well until I got another concussion but I still didn't know that it mattered. And so I didn't tell anyone that my head was throbbing. And I didn't tell anyone that I felt sick every time I got my heart rate up. And I kept wrestling for five weeks until I got so bad that I had to stop because I developed post-concussion syndrome. And I ended up with about a 15-year headache. And it wasn't until I found a doctor that I realized what I'd done wrong. The doctor told me it wasn't the concussion itself that really was the problem. The problem was I didn't speak up and I didn't tell anybody. And by continuing to get hit in the head, I essentially ruined my brain. And so I thought, gosh, it would have been really nice if someone would have told me that at any point in my 18-year contact sport career. I would happily have taken a week off if I knew it would save my brain. And so I thought, you know what? Other athletes need to know this too. And so I ended up writing a book called Head Games Football's Concussion Crisis in 2006. And I started a foundation, the Concussion Legacy Foundation in 2007. And we've been telling athletes to speak up when you have a concussion. Raise your hand and take yourself out. And for the last 10 years, everybody's been doing that. The CDC is messaging for kids. It's better to miss a game than to miss the whole season. What they're telling you as parents, talk to your kids about taking themselves out of the game when they have a concussion. And it's great, and it's the right message, but after 10 years, we found it doesn't work. Most athletes are still not reporting their concussions. And we probably should have known why, but there are two real problems to this philosophy. One is that athletes don't always want to come out of the game. So when Calvin Johnson, the great NFL player, retired, he was brutally honest and said, we didn't tell our coaches about our concussions. We wanted to keep playing. We wanted to be there for our teammates. An honorable thought, something hard to overcome to change that culture. The second problem we probably should have seen coming, and that is when you have a brain injury and your brain is the thing that's supposed to recognize when you're injured, you can't recognize your own brain injury. It's that loop again. So of course, you might think, you're chewing on sand when you're chewing on your teeth because your brain's injured. So it was hard enough for me to realize that when I was hurt. Imagine what it's like for your 11-year-old child when they head a ball the wrong way and they suddenly don't realize what's going on. Are they going to have the wherewithal 
to self-diagnose their own brain injury as an 11-year-old and then overcome the stigma of pulling yourself out of a game? Probably not. It's a losing strategy. And if we don't change that, the problem is kids keep getting hurt. And so the solution to this problem, like most problems, could be found in an old book. When I was working on head games, I'd heard there was a diary kept by a Harvard football coach from before my time. And I thought, I'm going to read this thing and find out that they even talk about concussions decades ago. And what blew me away was not only were there concussions throughout this book, but the coach and the team doctor gave a speech to the team before the season. We got everybody together and they said, in case any man in any game gets hurt by a hit to the head so he does not realize what he's doing, his teammate should at once insist time be called and a doctor come onto the field to see what's the trouble. They said, don't let your friends play with a concussion. Does anybody remember getting this speech when you were an athlete at any point in your life? Not a single hand raised in this room. This is wisdom lost to history. Would it surprise you if I told you this is from the Harvard football coach's diary in 1905? 1905, Bill Reed gave this speech, and it has not been heard since. And the problem is, this is hurting kids. This is Rowan Stringer. Rowan Stringer was a rugby player, a teenage rugby player in Ottawa, Canada, who got a concussion, but she was one of the best players in the team, and they had a game three days later, and she wanted to play. And so she didn't tell her parents, and she didn't tell her coach. She did tell a friend, but the friend didn't say anything, and she went out and played, and she got hit in the head again, and she got what's called second impact syndrome, and she died. And this happens to a handful of teenagers every year. And the problem was her friend didn't know what to do. This is her friend's version of the events. I think we did talk about it being a concussion. Um, nothing was obviously diagnosed. We never went to see a doctor or anything, but uh, that was what we had sort of concluded on our own. What was your advice to her in those text messages? Um, I told her she should probably tell someone about it, get it checked out. Um, she wanted to play the last game, so we decided, I told her if, um, if things didn't get any better, if they got worse than after the game, she should definitely go see someone, but obviously we never got to that. Imagine how both those lives would be different if she'd heard that talk. And that's part of the inspiration for why the Concussion Legacy Foundation launched a program we call Team Up, Speak Up to fight concussions. We are essentially bringing back this 100-year-old speech because Harvard football coach Bill Reed had it figured out that we now have the academics to understand why this speech works. It uses what's known as the bystander intervention model. Your kids know this because that's what they're taught in anti-bullying classes. This is all about changing social norms. Instead of hiding concussions, you talk about them. And probably the smartest part we are taking a, what's a boring public health message and we're framing it as a cool, be a good teammate message, which every coach wants to talk about. So we ask every coach before the season to just spend one minute, one minute giving a speech to their team with these three essential points. Good teammates look out for each other, especially when it comes to concussions. You're expected to speak up to a coach or a team leader if you think your teammate has a concussion. And you can save your teammate's career, like mine, or you can save their life, like Rowan's. The good news is we've had tremendous success since we launched this campaign. We had over 250 organizations sign up this year to take part in Team Up Speak Up Day that covered 5 million athletes. We're talking about some of the big ones. U.S. Lacrosse had Team Up Speak Up Week, USA Rugby, Team Up Speak Up Week. Right now, it is USA Hockey's Team Up Speak Up Week. And I have Jeremy Roenick out there spreading the good word, inspiring coaches to invest one minute in trying to save their athletes' careers. We have a lot of fun on Team Up Speak Up Day. We ask coaches to film the video and post it on social media so we can watch it. And we had participation in 49 out of 50 states verified where we just, these speeches come in, they're creative, they're fun, and we're literally watching them dust off a speech that hasn't been heard in 100 years and share it. And it's amazing, 
and it feels good, but we need you because every child needs to hear this speech before every season because every team is new and every coach relationship is new, and we need coaches giving this speech. And so we ask everyone to sign up at teamupspeakup.org to learn how to give this speech, be reminded to give this speech, because we all know a child playing sports that we care about. It could be a child, it could be a youth coach, it could be your grandchild, and they're going to get hit in the head. And they may end up being that kid wandering on the sideline, chewing on their teeth, in need of help, and you're going to have to hope that their teammates have been trained to speak up. Thank you.